All right, good morning, everyone. Good job being on time. I'm Professor Zorowski. I'm excited for this semester with you all. I, um, I know I sat out really late last night, finally opened the class. I do have your notes, your notebook thing for today. Is there anybody who's like, wants to use, like, are you gonna use tablets, for example, to take notes in rather than this? Okay, well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about it. I'll pass these out, you know, click asking you a question that you have no information about. <laughs> okay, so Welcome back. Um, let's talk about what you need for the class. Um, one is a notebook. So I have the first chapter, I think, or most of the first chapter for you here, since I know it wasn't a ton of time to get your materials. Um, you will take all your notes into the notebook that you get from the bookstore. Um, it costs somewhere is like around $20 or less or more, very close to that. And it's um, the whole semester's notebook that you will utilize. You don't need a traditional notebook for this class. You'll utilize this notebook. There is on Canvas. So here's our Canvas. Here's our class. I'll click on that. And then if I scroll down just a little bit on our homepage, it says Zorowski Notebook PDF for Tablets. If you're somebody who likes to take notes into a tablet, you can load this onto your tablet, you can download it onto there. I know um, students in my classes in the past, some of them prefer to use their tablet. And the whole thing that's available in the, the bookstore is here for you to take notes into on your tablet. So that's up to you, because I know some people just use that tablet like their, their hand. So um, it is there for you. All right, let's talk about materials for the class. So materials that you need for the class. So free textbook, yay, right? So your textbook, the link is here. Uh, if you want, if you're somebody who likes a paper copy, may I borrow this? Oh, this is the book. This is not your whole book for this semester. This is actually for 111 and 112. So it has both the 111 portions about about this much of the book. Um, the 112 portion, we go into a lot more chapters, but not as in depth and detail. Um, so if you want a paper copy, they have this in the bookstore. I also, on Canvas and in your syllabus, I have a link if you wanted to be able you know, to try and find it. And everybody's pretty savvy and looking for deals. Um, you could find it out, out in the world. I think it's, what, what, was, what did you pay for the book? I don't know like 35, 36 bucks, something, I think. Something like that, you could probably find um, a little bit cheaper, but you have this free version that you can utilize on any device. So you have that there, so that's great. And then um, the Zorowski notebook in the bookstore and your lab book. Please make sure you have your lab book for, I'm trying to think, this week I think we're okay, by, by next Tuesday, you've gotta have your book, okay? So this is the, lab book that you need. Those are your materials. Okay, um, other things. I've gotten lots of great information in here. You have a few assignments that are due a week from today. Very simple, easy things. And um, I've got like a checklist. I would say go through the getting started module. The syllabus is right there. Just read the syllabus carefully. The getting started module, it goes through the high the highlights of what I expect from you in this class. So make sure you just read each of these little items here. You do have, after you read all of those items in the getting started module, they're not very long. You do have a quiz. 
So I would do that first before you take the quiz. And it's just, again, to get you acclimated and ready to go with what are my expectations of you in this class. So I've got it in the syllabus, I've got it in getting started, and then you have that syllabus quiz. Certainly, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask before class, before lecture, after lecture, during lab. We're gonna spend a good six hours a week together, so you've got a lot of access to asking me any questions that you have. In addition, if you have a question outside of class, I love Canvas messages, because I go there pretty often. Um, I prefer that over email, so please use Canvas messages. Uh, that brings us to the third or the fourth thing that you really need for this class or for any class on this campus, get the app, the Morning Valley app, the Canvas app. It's great because you can send messages to all your professors right through any device with that app. You've got everybody's names connected into your app and you can see it'll give you like what's due today, what's due tomorrow. It gives you a calendar of your assignments. Um, it's really wonderful. So I highly encourage you if you don't have the Canvas app yet, go onto the App Store or Canvas and download that and it'll work, walk you through how to connect that to Morning Valley. Anybody, any questions about materials you need for the class? Okay. Um, this class, your lifeline to doing well in this class are going to be my notebook. My notebook, the labs, any little assignments we do are all tied around course objectives. So let's talk a little bit about course objectives. Um, I did not put yours up. I will have them up probably during lab time, but I'll show you my other classes objectives. The course objectives tell you what do you need to know for each chapter. If something on the course objectives chapter is not in the textbook, you don't have to worry about it. Everything will be in my notebook and on the course objectives. My notebook goes right with the course objectives. That is the stuff you can be tested on. Tests are 50 questions, multiple choice. They do include illustrations. So as you'll see in my notebook, I do put a lot of illustrations in there like this, for example. Make sure that as you're studying your objectives and you're going through your notes that you study any images. Images can be on will be on the exam. So um, I know when I was in your place in college, I would go, oh cool, there's a picture. I don't have to study that. I can skip that page. Oh look, another page with a picture. Skip, skip, no, no, no. I choose these precisely because they go along with the objectives. So make sure you're studying them because they may show up on exams. So 50 questions, multiple choice. Uh, extra credit in this class, I only give you on the exams. I make the exams 53 questions, but it's out of 50 points. So what that means is that you can get three, quest three questions wrong on the exam and still get a perfect score. If you get 53 out of 53, then you have three extra credit points. So those are extra bonus ones. The way that I use those extra credits, those three, it's not the last three questions are the extra credit, it's any three questions are extra credit. So you could get like question one wrong, question 15, and question 48. And getting those three wrong, you still get a perfect score of 50. Okay, so it's not just 51, 52, and 53 that you have to get right to get those three extra credit points. So I make it a lot more flexible for you, so that helps. Um, Pretty simple, straightforward. The labs go with the objectives. So labs, I like to say a point is a point is a point. A point on an exam is the same as a point on a lab. So you wanna make sure that when you're in lab, you are focused, you are doing your best work. I like to say you are being excellent. You are being your best self. Because those labs, they're gonna help you to learn the material and the objectives for the course and the stuff that will show up on the exams. So everything in this class is precisely designed to help you learn what you need to learn for the exams. Okay, okay let's talk about the course objectives. So I will have them up soon, today. They will look something like this.
towards objectives. Now this person has, we'll talk about doing the objectives and using them. The course objectives are just like this, number one. Number two, you can see they're just short topics that you need to study, number three. And then you will also, as an assignment for every unit exam, you will write up the objectives or you will do the objectives. So, for example, this person has taken the objective sheet. I will put the objectives in a PDF and a Word document, and then you can write right into that document, and you just kind of answer what the objective says. It's in here. Use your book as a supplement. If you need a little bit more clarification or you want to add something, then go to the book. But everything is in my notebook. So I'm going to show you, for example, um, different ways you can do the objectives. And I'm going to first give you really good examples of how to do the objectives. Your objectives are essentially the unit notes. So if you are, when you are writing up the objectives and you have three pages and there are 70 pages of notes, you're probably not doing enough. Uh, the way that I grade that assignment, it is due the day of the exam, and I grade them based on a five to one scale. If you do a thorough job, I give you five. If you like write them up, but you have, and it says like in, uh, illustrate, um, and you don't have any illustrations in your objectives, you'll probably get like a four, depending on how many illustrations are in there, asked of you, maybe a 3.5. If you don't turn them in, you get a zero. If you do like a tenth of them, you'll probably get like 0.5. So I just look and see how thorough you are. The more thorough you are, which just means again, go back to your notes and see how thorough I am on covering the objectives. That's what you should work on and write about. So this person did a really good job. I'm just gonna kind of scroll through the objectives. You can see this person used their tablet to write into them, they added pictures. When it called for adding pictures, they just stuck them in. This person did get a five out of five, and you can see how thorough they were with them. Here's another good example. So one, you can do them, you can, if you wanted to do them like on Word or, um, I'll put up an RTF document too. RTF means a rich text format. You can open that in any word processing program. So I'll put up a docx, an RTF, and a PDF. So if you wanted to do this like in Word or you wanted to open up in um, a note-taking program, you could open it up and you can type right into it. So this was a good example. Here's another good example. This person just used their note-taking program on their tablet. They rewrote each of the objectives. Again, you can see how thorough they were with each of the objectives. They're adding in pictures where they needed to add in pictures. And you can see a lot of work has gone into these. These are all students who got A's in my class because they used the objectives thoroughly to study. And they go on. Here's another good example. If you're somebody who likes to do note cards, the student liked to do them on note cards and they wrote them out and you can put them on note cards. So they did about one note card per objective. And this student liked to write in a notebook. So if you wanna take a notebook, like a traditional notebook, a paper notebook, and you wanna hand write your objectives, what you can do instead of tearing them out on the day of the exam, you can hand in your notebook to me and then I'll look at them in the notebook and I'll give them back to you. So then that way by the end of the semester, you've got all of your objectives in one notebook. Don't rip them out, because it's nice to have them all in one place. Um, so this person handed in a notebook. Again, you can see lots of illustrations were called for. And all of these four got, again, an A in the class because they did the objectives thoroughly. Now, what I would recommend, and this is the method that these students have utilized because I talked to them about it, is that after every class, you sit down, like tonight, I'll have the objectives up, sit down tonight, write out all the objectives that we covered. 
go through them again. Then on Thursday, you'll continue on. You'll cover any objectives that we covered on Thursday. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna go back to Tuesday's objectives, you're going to study those, and then you're gonna study Thursdays. And every time we meet, you're gonna go forward and then go back and review. The week before the exam, what you want to start doing is you want to start quizzing yourself on the objectives. So I have often a lot of students say, I knew everything, I studied so hard, and then I say, okay, well, what did you do? And they're like, well, last night I started writing up the objectives. And I was like, wait, last night you started? The day before the exam? And they're like, yeah, and I spent the whole night writing them up. But they didn't have time to study them. I'll talk about a lot of keys to learning in this class. All of you are going into very competitive career paths and you need to know how to study now. It is very important that you all get A's in all of your classes. There are there is so much competition in all of your career paths that being your best academic and most excellent self now is critical. If you think, I can't do Moraine Valley because it's just like a community college, no big deal. This is the same class that is taught at U of I, UIC, University of Chicago, Harvard. It's the same class, the same general biology one. Same class, same objectives, same expectations. You need to get an A in this class, you need to get an A in all your classes. Make sure that you're keeping that GPA up so that when you leave here and then you go on to another two years and then you go on to your professional school, that you are going to have a spot in that professional program after undergrad, but it all starts today. Make good choices. I have a little thing in here about how to study. If you think you know how to study, I'm gonna hopefully tweak a little bit of that. Some of you probably have this down, but I like to say train for exams. You will take your exams in here, at a desk, in a proper chair, no drinks, no pets, no bed, no food, no music, no streaming, no phone, no social media. It will be you in silence. The more that you can mimic this environment, when you come in here to take the exam, your mind, body, and soul will be like, yeah, this feels familiar. When I studied that stuff outside of this classroom, I was sitting in a proper chair at a proper desk. It was quiet, there was no food, there was no phone. It was just me and my material. That will eliminate tons of stupid mistakes. You know when you take an exam and then you're like, oh my God, I got 10 wrong because I just misread the question? It is very likely, it is because your study habits did not match the testing environment. And your brain is looking for what happened to the bed. When I studied, when I was familiar with this stuff, I was laying down and I was comfortable. Now I'm in this chair and it feels uncomfortable. And then your brain is searching for that, or your phone, and all the noise that you had going on, and you are not able to completely focus on the exam. I've read tons of research that say the more you can mimic, mimic the exam environment, the less stupid mistakes you will make, the less test anxiety you will have. So when people say to me, I'm a bad test taker, I say, oh yeah, let's talk about how you study. And then I find that they're not good at studying. They're a bad studier, not a bad test taker. So make good choices now. It is hard to make changes. As humans, we don't like change. But if you spend 30 days of doing something toward a change you want to make by that 30 day, end of that 30 day period, it becomes second nature and you're comfortable. So start now. Today, commit to putting your phone away in another room, quiet, desk, chair, you and the material. And this should be true for any of your classes. You all have made a commitment to being in college. You all need to also communicate that to any of your friends, family, any loved ones that might distract you from this process. So Saturday, if you're like, oh my gosh, Saturday night comes along and you are have tons of things to do for class next week and your friends are like, let's go to a movie and then let's hang out afterward, you gotta make that choice 
How committed are you to giving that up so that you can stay on this path to excellence, so that you can move forward? And you can shake your head and all that at me and be like, she doesn't know what she's talking about, ridiculous. I do. I did this my sophomore year of college, well, end of my sophomore year of college, and then I got straight A's. But until then, I was fooling myself. I was like in my dorm room, on the couch, door open, music, people coming in and out. And I was like, I'm studying. Well, I wasn't getting great grades. When I went to the biology building and I sat down in quiet, put my phone away, all that, I started to become an A student. It just takes choices. You all have choices. So you've got to make good choices now. And I encourage you to make those changes today. The other thing is remember that when you make good choices about being a student and a great student, it feels really good, doesn't it? When you take an exam and you get an A, you really feel good. When you take an exam and you don't do well, you feel really bad. So um, that's the other thing is that you wanna feel good. You wanna be your most excellent self but that starts today. That starts before the exam and it starts right now. The other thing that starts right now is what I'm gonna ask you all is to put away your phones, like get them off your desk, your, your computers, and just focus. If you have children or you have, let's say you're caring for a loved one and you need to be like on call if something happens, then it is totally understandable to have your phone out. If not, make a good choice. Put your phone away. This is true for all your classes. That phone is the biggest distraction. So if you're studying or you're in class and you have your phone up, it's on silent, but you see those flashes, right? And you do this. That one second that you looked at that message or that notification, it takes you two minutes from that one second to get back into academic mode and learning mode. So if you're studying and you're doing this, you're studying your stuff and then, and every like 20 seconds you're looking here and you do that, you're studying for an hour, you will not have absorbed hardly anything. Because every two minutes from this back to here, you're not in full absorption mode. There's studies to prove this. So the phone thing, that is one of the hardest things to like put away. And I will tell you, as someone who doesn't use much social media as a choice, that I live a very fulfilled life. Like when I'm with my kids or my friends or colleagues, I put it away and I give them attention. And a lot of times people are like, you never had your phone out. I'm like, no, because I'm giving you my time. And I'm happy. And I know like my son, looking at what other people are doing, how other people are making money, how other people look like they're living these fulfilled lives, but then they like get off of this and then they're like really depressed. Um, my son, I'm teaching him that too, and he's like, no, you're right. When I'm with my friends in person and we're off our phones, we have so much fun. When we're all just sitting around and not talking to each other on our phones, it's not fun. And I'm like, right, you wanna be happy. So um, make good choices. Does anybody, oh, I'm gonna show you a bad example of objectives. I always like to start with good. This person kind of wrote them out, and they look like they start out doing a good job. You can see there's no illustrations in here, and they're done, four pages. They got a two, it's okay. On the exam, they got a D. So you can see the correlation between how you do the objectives. Also, there's a correlation with how often you visit those objectives. I would say at least couple hours every other day for this class. You don't have homework in this class, it's except for doing the objectives. That is your homework, but your homework takes discipline because they're not due until three weeks from now, but I will bombard you with reminding you, go home, write up these objectives. Go home, work on the objectives. You should be doing three things. You should write them up, you should review them, and you should quiz yourself on Right, review, quiz, right, review, quiz, right, review, quiz. And this is at least three times a week. Some of you may, like, I would say two hours, three times a week, at least, every week. And then the weekend before the exam, you gotta really pour it on and make sure you are quizzing, quizzing, quizzing. 
you have to quiz. This is the pinnacle of studying, is that a lot of students will say, I knew everything. And I say, okay, well, let's see if you knew everything. And then I start quizzing them on the objectives and then they don't really, they're not able to explain any of it. And I'll say, how did you know what you think you knew? How do you know that you knew everything? Well, I just like read them over. But did you ever quiz yourself on them? Did you check in to see if you actually knew what you think you knew? And they say, no. You gotta quiz yourself. The quizzing does a few things. One is that it allows you on something that you're weak on, one of the objectives, and you're like, oh, I just can't get this one. You need to keep going over that one until you can get it. The other thing is that when you go through the objectives and like the night before the exam, you're like, I got all these, I can explain them to somebody else clearly, it builds confidence. So here's more of lowering that test anxiety, is not only your study environment should match, but you should be able to know what you know. And that quizzing is a pinnacle thing, is that you can say, oh, yes, I quizzed myself, so I do know this material as opposed to just reading over notes, I'm reading over notes, I'm reading over notes. My freshman year, I just used to do that, go through the notes, I'd sit on the couch, and I'd read over the notes, and there'd be music and all that stuff, and I'd read them over, and I'd think, I went over these 20 times, I know them. But I never quizzed myself, so I didn't know that I knew what I think I knew. You gotta quiz yourself. So there's a lot of things that, choices you can make that will lift you up to being less anxious about exams, I mean, certainly if you walk in and you're not anxious, you are a lucky person, but most of us put pressure on ourselves. We are anxious about test taking. There's a little bit of that, but you can alleviate a lot of that by the choices you make and how you study. Okay, so my soapbox about studying, I will be on it all semester with you. If you don't like it, maybe you should go change to a different section. Because I, I do this because I want every one of you to fulfill your dreams. I want you to be who you want to be in the future. I will support you this semester to getting there. If you don't want to hear it, then maybe you should go somewhere else. But if you're like, okay, I'm, I'm up for all these reminders and this encouragement, I will be your biggest fan. I will check in with every one of you and make sure that you are doing what you can do to be successful, to be excellent. Anybody have any questions? Okay, so I think we'll go to, we'll go to the lecture. I like to start every class with a slide like this. It shows you the date today, if you see anything that's wrong on here, please let me know. I make mistakes. Um, today we're going to start with chapter one. We're going to go over the scientific method because that will match up what we're doing in lab today. We'll do a safety lab and we'll start on lab one. We will not likely finish lab one or maybe we will, we'll see. Thursday, we have time to finish up chapter one. Finish up lab one if we have not. And if you have finished lab one, during this time, you'll start on lab two. Again, materials, my notebook, on paper, you can buy it from the bookstore. If you prefer using a tablet, you're welcome to bring your tablet and take your notes right into your tablet. Other than a tablet for taking notes, again, I'm gonna ask you, put your phone away. The other thing is like, if the person next to you has their phone out, you're inclined to do this. Every time it makes a notification, you look at it, right? So even the person next to you can distract you with their devices. So tablet for taking notes. I showed you where it is at on Canvas. Paper, Swarovski notebook from the bookstore, lab book from the bookstore, free e-textbook, and then get that out. Right. Any questions? All right, let's talk about science. So chapter one, we're going to talk about the study of life and the science of biology, but it really kind of goes on to the science of everything. So let's talk about the science of biology. Um, you will see
that this goes along with my notebook. That you can see that it says the scientific method is a set of, and then you will write in outline procedures into this notes. Oh, yeah. So wherever you have a blank, you're gonna look up and you're gonna fill in that blank. This makes it easy, my method of taking notes um, from student feedback, I've developed this over the years based on what students have told me. And having less to take notes on allows you to listen more and it allows you to draw. If you need to draw anything that I'm drawing on the board or you have any ideas that you wanna draw in, write extra notes in and um, Kind of alleviate some pressure about taking notes as well. So we're going to start out with the scientific method. The scientific method, the set of procedures, it's kind of like a recipe. You just follow the steps. You do this first, then you do this first, then you do this, and then you do this, and then this, and then you come to the end. A recipe, your conclusion is, did I do all the steps right to make this thing for the recipe correctly? And then you confirm, yeah, I did, no, I didn't. And then you often will think about, well, where might I have gone wrong? What could I change for next time? And then you go back and maybe do it again. Scientific method when you're doing a recipe. We use the scientific method many times a day. When we make decisions, we start our decisions with, you make an observation, you see something, it starts to raise questions in your mind. So your observation, begins with usually an inquiry. I mean, the person just walked by, you might have just in the back of your mind like, hmm, I wonder where they're going, right? Or you see somebody who has a cool cup and you think, hmm, I wonder where they got that. That's cool, I like it, that would work for me. So usually you see something and you start to ask questions about it. Then you might research the question. One of the wonderful things about our technology nowadays is that if you have a question right here in your hand, you can just boop, 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 right? We do this all the time at home. I say something and then everybody's like, or they say something and I say, huh, I wonder if that's true. And then we have, one of us will go to the phone and look it up, right? And see, is that true, is it not true? Uh, I wonder, like we went to Six Flags this weekend. I wonder what time we're open to. Boop, 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 right in the phone, right? So um, we have a lot of ways that we can search out information. It's very convoluted how to get the facts or confirm something these days because there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. In science, we are very disciplined about how we communicate, what we have discovered, what kind of things we've studied, and that when someone is doing research, they will write it up as a paper, they'll do their own scientific methods, lay it out, they'll have an abstract, they'll have all the people that help them with it, a title, a descriptive title, they submit it to a journal. The journal has what we call peer review, Peer review means that, let's say that you are working on a specific kind of cancer research and you think that you have found the enzyme that causes this cancer and that you're working on a cure and you found something that can destroy that enzyme in the process and you write this up. Let's say that I am also a researcher for cancer of a similar kind to you I may be asked by the journal, they may say, can you do me a favor? Can you read this, make comments, and let us know if you think this is worth or ready to publish? And so then me, I'm a peer to that person, to you. I'll write up all my comments. They'll do this with usually like three, four, five different peer review scientists. And then sometimes it goes back to the original person who proposed publishing their work they make some tweaks to their paper. We might go through the process maybe two or three times before it's ready to publish. That's what we call peer review research. So when you are looking, and a lot of you are going into science fields, that you will be looking up 
what is somebody doing in the field? Or what is what kind of methodology could I utilize in doing my own research? You want to read these other people's scientific method. There is a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that goes into anything that's published in a journal. So in science, we don't like to call anything a fact because a fact can change based on current technology that I would say scientific research journals are as close to facts as we can get. That there is a lot of vetting and verification that what is published in those journals is true, is real, reliable information. You also, based on your observation and your research, you will create a hypothesis a hypothesis is an explanation. It's like a prediction. I'm going to do research on this specific kind of cancer. My hypothesis is this particular kind of chemical will destroy the enzyme that causes this kind of cancer cell. So I am going to write a prediction about what I think I'm going to get out of my study. Just like talking about Six Flags this weekend. If we were like, hmm, I wonder what time Six Flags is open until, and all of us said, well, I think it'll be open until nine. I think it'll be open until 10. I think it'll be open until eight. I think I remember seeing something. And right, we make a hypothesis, we take a guess and predict what we think the answer is, and then we look it up and find out yes or no. So one of the things about our prediction, we're going to test that, and that's when you use your methodology to get to, can I accept my hypothesis or do I reject it? We have um, some interesting language around hypotheses is that when we're talking about our, I like to say educated guess, right? Because you did a little bit of research to get here. At the end of our experiment, we're gonna go back to our hypothesis and we're gonna say, did we get it right or wrong? We don't like to say right or wrong in science because even something that, let's say you go through your scientific method, and um, your cancer research, let's say that the chemical you propose is going to kill the enzyme that kills the cancer cell, that that chemical doesn't work, but you learned a lot about maybe like thinking, oh, I bet it's this one part of my chemical. If I change that one part and make it a different chemical, then that might do it. So as you go through the process, it's not like you're wrong because you've learned a lot along the way. So in science, we don't like to say I'm right or wrong. Um, what that usually leads us to is that, okay, I'm gonna tweak that at the end of mine because I did not accept my hypothesis. We also say support my hypothesis, approve my hypothesis, but we don't use right or wrong. Um, when, oh, and one other thing is that a hypothesis can be a statement like this chemical will destroy the enzyme that destroys the cancer cell. So I make it like a statement. Or you can say, will this chemical destroy the enzyme that destroys the cancer cell? So you can make a, a question or an answer. I know a lot of you in high school, they said you have to do an if this, then that. We don't care about if thens. Nobody in science, well, hardly anybody in science uses that in the real world. Um, you go to a journal and you read, you don't see that if this, then that. They don't do that. So you just want basically a prediction based on your research of what you're trying to figure out. Question or statement, doesn't matter. Okay, so here's some examples of hypotheses. You can hypothesize it will rain today, or you could say, will it rain today? Both, same version of the same hypothesis. I mean, different version of the same hypothesis. Or, will I win the lotto today, or I will win the lotto today, right? You're gonna get that ticket, you're gonna watch when they pick the numbers, and then you're gonna confirm I accept my hypothesis, woo, you're rich, or bummer, you reject it. Okay, so given that, what you know here, I like to add in questions. The questions that I have in lecture are very similar to questions you can have on the exam. These will give you a feeling of what the exam will be like. Most of the questions on the exam are like this. They are application questions so that you really need to understand the material and be able to apply it to a situation. 
to show me that you know what you know. So my question is, which of the following is a hypothesis if you find your phone suddenly won't work? One, is this a hypothesis? My phone holds three gigs of music. Does that have anything to do with why it might not work? I mean, maybe, but is it a prediction as to why your phone won't work? No, because it, a prediction would be like, my phone holds three gigs of music, therefore it might be full and making my phone shut down. That would be a hypothesis. But just stating information about the phone doesn't, it's not a prediction about anything. It's a fact, it's, it's information about your phone. There's something wrong with the software on my phone. Yeah. Right, that is a good prediction of why your phone might not work, right? Buy the newest phone. That's the action you would take as your conclusion, but it doesn't tell you why your phone won't work. My phone has this many songs, this many videos, and 12 movies on it. That's information about your phone. And again, like number one, a hypothesis that would make this work would be, my phone has all of this, therefore it is really full and maybe shutting down the phone. Get new headphones. Is that a prediction about why your phone won't work? No. Okay. So good. So you all, a lot of you agreed with me that number two is the best choice here that supports a hypothesis that there's something wrong with the software on your phone. That is your prediction. Maybe then you mess around with your phone a little bit, you can't figure it out, you go to the Apple store, if you have an iPhone, the genius is going to try and help you, and then they conclude with, all you have to do is a software update, here's how you do it, or yeah, you gotta buy a new phone, so you get to that conclusion eventually. But this is your prediction here. Okay. If you have any questions about these questions, please feel free to ask. If during lecture you have questions, just raise your hand and ask, please. So this leads us, we've got a hypothesis, now we're gonna do our experiment. I like this. It is a carefully controlled set of manipulations. It's steps. It's like a recipe, right? You're going to do this, then you're going to do that, then you're going to do that. Um, we're going to make changes. We're going to manipulate things. We're going to use things. And we're going to try and support our hypothesis or not. We're going to test out our hypothesis. One of the things about experiments is that, let's say that you are that cancer researcher and you're in the lab. Everything you do, you're going to write out. Every step. Everything. Everything around you, you're gonna say what, what you're doing it, where you're doing it, you're gonna log the time. You might even like, depending on, let's say you're in a room that has a lot of windows, you might want to start tracking the weather in case sunlight, moisture, humidity, temperature starts, maybe that has an effect on your experiment that if things change day to day, you wanna write that stuff down. This is your data. Everything that you're doing in your steps and things that you notice during your steps. So like I said, if you're in a lab room and there's a lot of windows, you might wanna just like write down and as part of your data, it's really sunny and hot. It's really cold and damp. Those things might have an effect on how your chemicals are working in your experiment. Other things, let's say you're doing your experiment you're in a basement somewhere, pretty stable temperature every day, same lighting, but one day you notice like the smell of chocolate chip cookies while you're doing your experiment. Now you might go like, well, someone out there is baking chocolate chip cookies. I'm gonna find out about that later because I want a chocolate chip cookie that smells good. But also, what if it's your chemical reaction that's happening in your experiment? That might be important. So something as benign or just like you think that's not a big deal, you might want to write that down. Like, I just smelled chocolate chip cookie smell. Because let's say that you go through your whole experiment and you find that you do have the cure for this cancer and you're so excited, what you're going to do is you're going to take your steps, you're going to send them out to somebody, let's say in Germany, you have a friend, you met at a conference, they do similar research, you're going to set, not tell them the conclusion, but you're going to give them your methodology and say, can you do this and tell me what you get? And then they do it, and then they tell you what they get, and then you say, at step 
27, did you smell chocolate chip cookies? And they say, yeah, that was so weird, yeah. That was part of your experiment. So you never know when you're doing like scientific experiments, you never know what is just like no big deal and what might be a critical thing in your process. So you wanna write everything down. Everything you hear, see, feel, smell, etc. You never know. Then you're gonna to come to a conclusion. You knew all of your steps, you wrote down your data, and you're like, oh my gosh, this killed those cells. Then you're gonna start as part of your conclusion. Not only are you going to go back to your hypothesis, and you're going to support your hypothesis, because you go back to it and you're like, yeah, I was, and again, correct, and we like to say like, uh, accept, or in this case, refute or reject your hypothesis. Before you get all crazy and you call the media, right? You, it's your first time, you've done thousands of experiments, you've got to this time where you do find that this new chemical you just tried kills the cancer cells. Before you call the media and you're like, I have the cure for this kind of cancer, you wanna repeat it again and again and again and again yourself so that you know that what if something in the humidity had an effect on your experiment and you can't repeat it because it's not as humid the next day when you go to do it again? The media is gonna be like, wait, I thought you had it. The whole world is gonna be like, liar, right? You said you had it. So we have to like, when you're doing something in science and you accept your hypothesis and you're really excited, you wanna do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. And sometimes, if we're talking about like cures for cancer, you may do it a thousand times again. Then, you're gonna call your friends, right? You call that friend in Germany, you're gonna call maybe a friend in Austria, maybe you're gonna call a friend in the Philippines and you're gonna say, can you do this? And tell me what you get. And if they can repeat your experiment using your steps and get the same thing, then you're on a good track. You're probably gonna say, okay, you got it once, can you do it five more times? I'm sorry, but I just want to make sure. And once they do it, they're like, yeah, this is, I'm accepting your hypothesis too. This is good. It's good stuff. Okay, so it's very rigorous. There's a lot to the scientific method in general. The last part of your discussion, uh, excuse me, the last part of your conclusion is your discussion. You're going to say things that you noticed. You're going to say at step 27, I smell chocolate chip cookie smell. This works better with 80% humidity as opposed to 60% humidity. Got to make sure you control that. Any things that you took in your data that were like, oh, this is a thing that might be important to notice during this step and this during this step. And then what are you going to do? I sent it to this friend in Germany and Austria and the Philippines. And they got the same things, and then I did this, and then I did that. You're going to discuss all these things. So again, that comparison of other people, having other people repeat it. With humans, there are trials that you have to go through. Um, we can't just, like if you have this cure and you've had all these other people tested, you have to go through the government to follow the rules before you can release the cure, before you can work with a pharmaceutical company. So there's a lot of regulations on how to do this, which is a good thing. Um, we saw with COVID, with the vaccines, that that process, it was, remember Project Warp Speed, that was one of the good things that the president said, let's, let's, uh, let's like take that 10 years and let's put it into eight months. But you gotta do it faster and you gotta do more trials and there was a lot of stipulations around that that got the vaccine out faster than it normally would have. So um, there are a lot of regulations with this. Again, big thing is you can duplicate it, but can other people duplicate it? Do they get the same results that you got using your method? Because eventually, if you really have a cure, you're not gonna be the only person who's working on this eventually, right? You're gonna sell your patent, 
to somebody, and then other people are going to be doing it. Again, scientific method we use every day. We probably use it like 10, 20, maybe 40 times a day. We don't even realize that every time we observe something, we, do, we go through this process. Sometimes more rigorous, sometimes really less rigorous, right? Like Six Flags, we just went, oh, we want to go. Want to go to Six Flags? Okay. Yeah, let's, I wonder what time we're on the tell. We all say what time we think it is, we look on the app and done. Like, right? Within 30 seconds, we've gone through this. So, um, let's say you go out today, your car doesn't work. I'm glad your cars work today. Question, why would my car start? I'm sure it's not stated as nicely as this. And you go out and find your car won't work. You make a hypothesis. My car won't start because the battery is dead. So right away, you are going to see if your battery needs replacing. You replace your battery. Car doesn't start. You go back. Okay, it wasn't the battery. I replaced the battery. Maybe it's, I don't know anything about cars. Maybe it's this other thing. Then you go through, make a new hypothesis, go through, test it, right? Um, if your car starts, then you're like, conclusion, it was the battery. So simple things, we use it all the time. Key thing is, is when you come to your conclusion, if you reject your hypothesis or you do not support it, you go back, predict a new hypothesis. And so a lot of times in science, we're just going around and around and around. Okay, so, which is an equivalent to will I pass this class? An equivalent hypothesis. Give those a read over. One, two, three, four, five. Five? Someone say five? Four. Okay, well, four. Okay, good. Okay, good. Four. I see some fours out there. Four is the best choice. I will get to be in the class. That's passing, right? Okay. Will I get to see in the class? That's passing. So one, two, and four are all supportive of this question, but which one is the best? The one that mirrors. This is a question. This is the same question in the form of a statement. Okay, one of the things that we do in science is very often we do controlled experiments. Control means that everything is going to be very specific in how you do it. Good scientists are very specific on how they do things. There's two parts to a controlled experiment. There's our baseline control. And then you have the thing you're testing. And the thing you're testing is, is called variable or experimental group. You could have your baseline control. This is the thing that has all the parts of the experiment except for what you're trying to figure out. So like with your cancer research, for example, the, you're going to have to culture cancer cells and show that they do produce that enzyme that you are going to try and knock out with your, whatever your chemical is that you're using. So your control part of it is, I'm going to have a group where I just grow the cancer cells in a medium using this kind of auger or nutrients in this environment, and you're gonna make sure everything about growing those cancer cells works good. Because you don't want anything in how the cancer cells are grown to affect your outcome of does this chemical actually kill the cancer cells. So we wanna make sure the environment is stable. So you have your control group. I'm just gonna grow my cancer cells. I'm gonna make sure that they're well fed, they last through the entire experiment. Then you're gonna have your experimental group where you take your cancer cells that you've grown, 
and then at certain steps, you're going to expose them to that chemical to see if, it, if the chemical kills them. So you've got those two groups. We want to make sure that the environment is not affecting our outcome. And that's what we mean by a controlled experiment. So what are variables and why are they important? A variable is something that causes an observable change. So our chemical and our example of our cancer experiment, that is our variable because it's going to cause an observable change. It's going to kill the cancer cells, hopefully, or it's going to maybe it shrinks them, maybe it makes them grow, maybe it does nothing. So we're gonna see some kind of change, big or small, impactful or not, but that is our variable, is that chemical in the experiment. It's the only thing that is different than the control group. So again, we want to rule out that our environment does not have an effect on our conclusion. Does this chemical work or not? We want to make sure that, let's say we figure out, after you've been doing this for, you've done 500 experiments and they failed, 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 and then you realized, oh my gosh, I've been in this room where there's a lot of sunlight, and depending on the time of day, my experiment does better or worse. And you realize after 500 times of doing this, you're like, oh my gosh, the exposure to sunlight has an impact, the environment has an impact on my outcome of my experiment that has nothing to do with the chemical I'm testing. So then you wanna make sure that's stable. Maybe you put up blackout curtains so that every time you do the experiment, the sunlight does not have an effect on it. And then you're like, oh, this makes a big difference in my outcome. So that's an example of when the environment has an effect on your conclusion. Every little thing makes a difference. So all of those data points are very important. So we design these controls. We have the one group that doesn't get the variable, shows that our environment is stable both in the control group and in the variable group, they are the same except our variable group gets that one thing that the control group does not. So you can call it variable group or you can call it experimental group. We want to make sure we are keeping our environment stable so that we can conclude, does this variable have an impact on our experiment or does it not? Call it control group, stable. Does not get exposed to the variable. Environment, very important to keep stable. Amount of sunlight, amount of humidity. Maybe you change the light bulbs. Maybe you notice that the hospital that you work for went from fluorescent lights to LED lights. And then you notice, oh man, that totally changed how my experiment works. So those just little things you've got to be conscious of. And remember, when you do a controlled experiment, that it provides a standard of comparison between your environment and what you're testing. Does the environment not have an effect on this? Okay, good. Now I can like focus on just what is my variable and does it support my hypothesis and its effect. All right, so for example, Let's say we're going to do an experiment. One of the things about our experiment is we focus on one variable at a time. With your cancer experiment, if you're doing like, I'm going to subject my cells to this chemical and this chemical and this chemical and this chemical, and you do 10 different chemicals, and you're kind of like running yourself ragged, trying to do 10 of these different chemicals, you might not be following the same protocols for every single chemical. Perhaps you're trying to figure out their molar capacity. Maybe they're not the same, and then you gotta figure that out. If there's too much to focus on, you are very likely to make mistakes in your methodology. 
So a good experiment focuses on one variable at a time. So here, for example, if we're looking at some mice and we have group A and B, we're going to make sure that they have the same amount of water, the same size cage, the same amount of sunlight and dark, and one's going to get whatever the normal mouse diet is, and the other one's going to get a low-carb diet. What is the variable? The diet. Good. The diet, right? Okay. The diet is the variable because it's the one thing, everything is the same except for the diet. We're going to look at a couple of successful experiments. These are historical. He's got us thinking about big ideas in science and especially in biology. Okay, so one of the things you observe is that um, this happened a long time ago. This was done by uh, Francesco Ridi. He noticed that and at this time in the world, it was I think the 1800s, I believe, uh, that people believed that life could just poof, come out of nowhere. Well, that spontaneous generation. Do we support that now? Can things, can living things just pop up here and there? So we don't support that now, and it's because of this experiment here, and what people had noticed that food, because they didn't have refrigeration at the time, and maybe they just left food out, that food, when you leave it out, what they saw was that these little like wormy maggot things appeared, and they were like, they are just spontaneously generating out of nowhere. And Francesco Ridi was like, I oh, don't know, that seems like kind of weird. Let me do an experiment to test this. So what he did, so his hypothesis was flies produce the maggots, because he was like, something's got to be making these things appear. And he did notice that flies were there and swarming around for days, and then the maggots appeared, and he put that all together, and he's like, maybe these two things are related somehow. And now we know that the offspring or the juveniles of flies are maggots and then they metamorphose into the fly form. So he did a simple thing. He took two jars, same size, took two pieces of meat from the same cow, cut a piece of meat in half, made them about the same size. He left this one open to the air. He covered that one with a cloth. After a few days, what he found was that the flies could get into this jar, and after a few days, the maggots appeared. And he observed here that this one that was covered, the flies couldn't get in, and after a few days, no maggots appeared. And he was like, see people, th this thing actually is the parent of that thing. And people were like, whoa, trippy, right? I mean, you don't know what you know until you know it. So he showed a lot of people that maybe we need to protect our food a little differently, keep us healthy, not waste it, and things like that. And this was a huge discovery. All right, here's another, another experiment. People observed that male widow birds, so these are the widow birds, that males with really long tails were more attractive to females. And he wanted to know why do the males in general, and in, in, in comparison to females, that males had much longer tails than females. So he wanted to know why. His hypothesis was males have long tails because females prefer to mate with long-tailed males. So in this experiment, they actually had one, two, three variable groups. Again, might have been hard to keep an eye on all of this, but so here's a like an average, let's say average size male widow bird. And what they did is they took one widow bird and they cut the tail short. And the part that they cut off, they glued onto a male with a normally short tail. 
And then another one that had a short tail, the part they cut off, they added to a male who already had a long tail and made that tail longer. So you can see the average size. This one has a much longer tail than the average size. This one they made to the average size even though it had a shorter tail. And this one they cut the tail short. Everything in the experiment, the access to females, the amount of food, the place they lived was similar or the same. And what they found was that this male had an average of one female nest per week. This one had about one per week. So the one that you added the longer tail to, now maybe before they didn't have any mates, now they got one per week as opposed to zero. This one that was shorter, less than half a nest per week. And this one that you made exceptionally long had two nests per week. So supporting the hypothesis that the longer tails are preferred by the females. Okay, we got a few minutes left. Um, what I want you to do is at least work with the person next to you or behind you. If you absolutely prefer to work alone, that's fine, but I encourage you to work with someone else if you want to. What you're going to do is you're going to, and this is one of your objectives, so you can use this as your objective when you write this up. Based on the information that I'm giving you here, you are going to state a question that you have about this information. You're going to formulate a hypothesis and then you're going to design a simple controlled experiment to test it. So your information says that members of the population of wild Palos Hills monkeys have been found dead near the stream that runs through their home forest. Along the stream to the south are residential homes and to the north is an iPhone factory. You can go in a lot of different directions with this information in terms of a question you have, a hypothesis you have made, and an experiment. Okay, so I'm going to give you Three minutes, again, talk to the person next to you or behind you. You want to work alone, that's fine. But you got three minutes to put this all together.
more seconds, so wrap it up. If I could have some people volunteer what your group came up with, I would greatly appreciate it. And someone start us off. Why are the tailless toes monkeys dying? Okay, great. That's awesome. What's your experiment? Uh, run as slash test the streams for any pollutants and chemicals, and then compare them to the streams around tailless toes. Awesome. Okay, great. That's great, thank you. Someone have something different that they can volunteer. We get two more. Thank you. So, um, can you question uh, like why the milk is not so good? And then um, our hypothesis was there was a lack of resources Very different and valid, right? And great ways to test what's going on. One more, please. One more, one more. One, anyone? I'll wait. One more group, please. One more person. So all like similar paths, but very different as well. And you can see that with, you know, when somebody comes and they're like, what is going on? The monkeys are dying. You can go in a million different directions. And how that you go through your scientific method and, and you're like, I don't know, there's nothing about the chemicals. There's nothing about the water. Maybe it is the lack of resources, you know? So you can keep changing your hypothesis and going back to the beginning. Thank you for volunteering. Um, all right, we are going to stop there. We are in 167 after this. I think it's on the other side of the building. I can't remember where 167 will find it. Um, typically what I like to do is I like to get to lab and do a little pre-lab so people can get working. And then once we're beginning the lab, you can go take a break. So that way, if people want to just like power through for the three hours, you can. Um, during lab, you can get up and use the restroom or go to the coffee shop. As long as you're just not like, I'm going to go ditch my lab partners. I'm going to go eat breakfast. I'm going to come back in an hour and then copy everything they're doing. A quick break or whatever, you know, like you have technically 15 minutes is reasonable. But let's all go to 167 and then...